the DNR Water Appropriations Program. That's another, that's also in EWR, but that's a different permit program. And then the dam safety program. So that's basically when you have a high hazard dam, that's um, a different program. And then the last two bullets are, you know, um, the <coughs> wetland areas that are not public waters or the wetland fringes of public waters located in both of which WL are regulated under Wetlands Conservation Act. Um, and the shoreland areas, shoreland areas above the OHW are administered um, by the local government units under their shoreland ordinance. And then here's just a list of things that are covered under our permit program. I'm not going to read all those. Um, and um, most of you probably know we have an online permit application system. It's called MPARS. Um, that's where we apply for permits. Um, and then I just put in here, sometimes we, I forget about environmental review. There's another unit in my ecolo DNR, Ecological and Water Resources, which manages DNR environmental reviews. Um, and so we can't issue a public waters work permit for a project that's undergoing an environmental review until the environmental review process is complete. So, um, a permit can be applied for, but we can't issue the permit until, because the, the whole concept is that the environmental review should be informing the permit process, you know, like potential conditions or limits or, you know, even possibly denying the permit. Um, and so it doesn't make, you're kind of getting ahead of the process to um, issue a permit before the environmental review process is done. Um, and here's some of the types of projects, and you guys probably work on lots of these. Um, of the kind of common types of projects that require a public body's work permit that undergo environmental review. So, um, and there's more, but that those are kind of common ones. And then I wanted to, um, just I'm getting towards the end, I wanted to just mention a little bit about you know, buffer law, the OHW, and normal water level. Um, so the buffer law says the width of a buffer must be measured from the top or crown of the bank, where there is no definable bank measurement must begin from the edge of the normal water level. So really what that's saying is from a lake or wetland, where there's no, you know, because there's no definable bank with a lake or a wetland, measurement must begin from the edge of the normal water level. So, and then um, there's a definition of normal water level. Um, and if you read that definition, it's different than OHW. And so, um, so kind of the take home point is that the definition of OHW and normal water level are similar. Um, and they might lead you to the same point on the landscape, but they're not the same definition. Um, and this got, a, and, Bowser, um, so they're the agency, the Board of Water and Soil Resources. They, um, you know, the, they basically kind of oversee um, the soil and water conservation districts, and so, um, you know, and so they have they have the bigger role. The, the DNR doesn't have any role in administration or enforcement of the buffer law. Our role was to create the buffer map, and then Bowser working with the SWC in the counties for drainage ditches um, are responsible for enforcement and um, implementation. And one of the little tri you know, tricky things that Bowser's kind of worked with the DNR on is um, you know, the, the shoreline ordinance that we talked about before has required a buffer on public waters since day one. Right? And so it says public waters must require under their shoreline standard in in agricultural areas, um, but most counties, but the shoreline ordinance was, there it is, it's the locals are administering, you know, administering that. Um, most of them weren't requiring buffers. You know, there was some, there was several counties that did, you know, Dakota counties, like, you know, uh, kind of a show, there's, I don't mean to exclude anybody. There are several, like half a dozen counties out of 87 that were doing a really good job enforcing the buffer standard in the shoreline ordinance um, but the rest of the counties were just kind of ignoring it because the local um, 
you know, gains would be so high, you know, if they just decide to do that, that the, you know, the company commissioners would probably get voted out or whatever. So part of the reason, part of the purpose of the buffer law was to give more, more weight um, to, you know, we have to do, we have to implement buffers, but the buffer law also says it has to be, you know, public waters, 50 foot buffer, you know, um, min, or, you know, minimum 30 foot, average 50 foot. The shoreline ordinance doesn't, has different language. The shoreline ordinance refers to OHW. It has different width criteria. The buffer law refers to normal water law. And so there, there has to be some work through um, Bowser's developed some model ordinances working with the DNR for the locals to adopt to help them navigate through these different definitions. Um, and so, um, you know, some of you who might be working on, uh, um, you know, buffer implementation will kind of understand the nuances here with that discussion. Um, so then, oops. Um, so I, you know, I don't know if you guys normally distribute um, presentations, but I had some links there of things that I referred to. Um, if there's time, I had a couple more scenarios we could talk through. Is there time for me to go a couple more? Do you want to wait till Q and A? Should I just pr proceed? Okay. So this will just maybe take five minutes. So another example of where it might be, you know, where uh, this is a question I got a lot from, um, you know, kind of related to buffer, you know, where do we put a buffer? So in this situation, um, what you're looking at here is you see the stream, that's Walker Brook, that's in Clearwater County, um, that by Bagley. And um, <coughs> what you see is um, it's a public water course but you can also see, hopefully, they will stop kind of working here. Let me see. <coughs> it has a big wetland fringe around that water course. Now, the that wetland is not a public water wetland. So, if you look at the PWI map, all that you see is a water course line tracing Walker Brook, basically. And so, then the question would come up: Well. Where's, you know, where's top of bank jack? You know, you can't even get to it. You know, you'd sink it over your head in monk. Is that a term you guys use a lot? Monk? <laughs> so in peat, you'd be up over your head in, in liquid peat. Um, and so you can't ever get to that. I did my thesis work on this stream, which is kind of why I um, put it up here. You can't, it's almost impossible to get to the actual where the water flows. Um, and so where's, where's the, there's really no bank there. Like, you know, that other picture I showed before in the ag setting, there's really no bank there. So, you know, where do we measure the buffer from? And which is really, you know, where's the OHW? And so um, what I'd say is the OHW is basically right where you see the water flowing. It's going to be right where that stream is where you see the, the flow concentrated, you know, the stream signature. Um, and so, it, so a, in a setting like this, the rest of that wetland and forest, what, you know, is, a, is buffering that stream. So nobody needs to do any buffer in that area, like do anything special. It's already being buffered. Um, the question would come up, so in comparison, um, is if sometimes you have a public water water course flow through a public water wetland, so it's a wetland complex, um, and I, I'll hold that, I have an example of that. So here's the same thing, um, and so this is, um, you know, a, a, a LIDAR-derived product that the DNR created, we call it HPI, which stands for Hydrologic Power Index, and you know, it's a whole talk on how this was derived. But basically what it does is it helps the water flow features pop out in elevation differences. Um, so you can see kind of the channel of Walker Brook flowing through and you can really see, um, you know, the area of red is off basically equal elevation. And so you can really see that that's just a broad valley. You know, you have, a, you know, a, a little stream flowing through it. Um, 
And so again, the you know the the OHW would be where you see the stream signature, not way off on the edge of that on the valley, which is its floodplain. Uh, here's another example from my days as area hydro. So this is um this is Six Mile Marsh, which is um and Six Mile Creek, which is a tributary into Lake Minnetonka in uh, Minnetrista area. Um, and the, the green polygon is Six Mile Marsh, which is a public water wetland, um, and then it flows into Halstead's Bay of um, Lake Minnetonka, right where it turned blue there. And so you have Six Mile Creek, Six Mile Marsh, and Lake Minnetonka shown in that picture, three different public waters. And so in this case, um, again, the, the public water, the you have a public water course flowing through a public water wetland. So in this case, the, the OHW for the stream doesn't really matter because if, if somebody's going to do a project in this area, they're going to have to stay out of that, out of the wetland, out of Six Mile Marsh. And so it's going to be what's the OHW of Six Mile Marsh is what's going to kind of influence if a permit's required or not. It doesn't really matter. Um, what it is for the stream. And then um, in this case, so you can see, um, you know, the, the again, like the first example, the stream requires a buffer under our buffer law, but the wetland, even though it's a public water, it doesn't require a buffer because the buffer, um, it was decided that public water wetlands that don't have a shoreline classification um, don't require a buffer. So in this case, um, uh, it doesn't, six, the six mile marsh serves as the buffer for Six Mile Creek and in most of those cases there might be, you know, this little pinch point right up, right up there. There might be a little buffer, you know, required there. Okay, so that was all I was planning to present. So, did we? Yeah. I guess the <clears throat> the one question that I had was when they made the public water inventory maps, it seems like there was intent, and maybe the intent was to protect the fish lakes, the lakes deeper than 15 feet in depth, and maybe the intent was to you know, protect those waterfall nesting habitats or, um, you know, type 3, 4, and 5 wetlands over 10 acres in size or 2.5 in the municipal areas. You know, kind of the shallow lake, 6 to 15 feet in depth. And I think in a certain sense, you know, sometimes I've had a couple of projects where the whole wetland got changed to a shrub swamp and then you're just sitting there going, well, you know, this doesn't really fit anymore and we're trying to do this project and so sometimes I think it would be helpful to have the intent, you know, the rule, you know, maybe right. a little bit more emphasized and then, you know, with regard to the, the buffer, um, uh, uh, the buffer program, you know, to say that um, it's where hydrophytic vegetation or hydric soil, I kind of think you maybe ought to just have hydrophytic vegetation and analysis because a lot of times you see the hydric soil going, I guess, to a higher level than where you begin to see the hydrology affecting the hydric soil to create enough wet habitat, you know, for the hydrophytic vegetation. So, that, you know, say in a hydric, hydrophytic vegetation or um, hydric soils is a little bit questionable, you know, putting them in the same category you know, for determining a normal water. That's just my opinion. So. Right, and you know, we don't make, like, um, so regarding the definition of normal water level, that the legislature came up with that definition, and um, my understanding is that they kind of went behind closed doors and came out a couple hours later with a buffer law, so there maybe wasn't a lot of the normal <laughs> vetting and review by agency, affected agencies on coming up with some of this. Um, I do know there was a, it was kind of purpose not to use OHW because that's kind of too abstract um, as kind of 
the starting point for the buffers. So it would really require a rule change board. I did lean to the Bowser guidance. Like the guidance might expand on a little bit. I don't know if you've read that, but that might provide some information that might put you at ease a little. I don't know. Might, you know, when they elaborate on it. Um, as far as public waters, that's really, you know, that's kind of a common complaint is we have a, a public water that doesn't, right today, doesn't meet the definition of a public water. We don't have the statutory authority to remove those from the public water's inventory. You know, one, you know, we probably wouldn't seek that kind of authority because what it does is it helps potentially preserve the potential for restoration of some of these features. Now, sometimes that might just not be, uh, you know, at all possible. But um, you know, if we did, if these were just taken off, I mean, which we can't do anyway, but we probably wouldn't advocate for them because then, but at least now they're being somewhat protected, even though they they might not meet the definition. Um, but if once we say, oh no, you can do, you know, it, um, we could, well. It, it kind of depends on we could reclassify it so that it will be managed under WACA, but we have to be careful about that too because sometimes WACA allows things that we don't under public water work rules and we're not supposed to do that if it lowers the protection level. So anyway, yeah. yeah. Two questions. Uh, do you see the <coughs> existing Hard maps, you know, the old uh, PWI maps being digitized at some point in the future. And uh, secondly, can you use uh, the buffer maps as a substitute to demonstrate the PWI water? Um, good question. So the first question about, so um, we have that blob map that I showed, and those were actually produced as hard copies and mailed to each county. And, you know, we you could still order them, I think, somewhere from... Minnesota library or something if you wanted hard copies of that. Whereas there there hasn't been a similar effort done to create hard copies using, you know, the digitized layer. We do have about 15 maybe counties that were done, you know, about five, ten years, probably ten years ago, um, that were digitized. Um, what happened is that you know that effort kind of had some momentum and then what happened is as um, kind of GIS systems became more prevalent out, you know, kind of everywhere, like with, you know, your local government units and, and consulting companies, um, then the demand for the paper map just kind of, we don't ever, we hardly ever hear anybody asking us for a digitized version, paper copy of that map. So we don't have any plans to continue with those, um, try and create those. Um, you know, a lot of, you know, I know when I, when I was, I think a lot of counties are similar where when I was um, area hydro for Carver County, you know, they had, they had the public waters inventory um, and, you know, available right as part of their own, their own property database. And so they could print off, you know, they could print maps that showed all of those public waters using, you know, it was a digital generated map. And so, so I think that kind of ability kind of reduced the demand. Um, and then your question about um, the buffer, can the buffer map be used as kind of a proxy for the public water? You really can't because um, for two reasons. One, like I said there, the buffer, um, public water wetlands without a shoreline classification don't require a buffer. So those public waters aren't on the buffer map. So you'd be missing a lot of wetlands right away. The other thing that we've done is, you know, how I've said it's, it's, we're limited in what we can take off the public waters inventory. We're not as, we're not as restricted about what we can take off the buffer map. So we have a lot of scenarios out there where out on the landscape where you might have a water course that was tiled or it's been it's buried, it's being farmed, you know, where there's really no channel anymore, but it's on the public water. You know, and if you look back, it was proper at the time, you know, it's on the USGS quad, it was proper at the time of the inventory, probably to include it. Um, and so 
um, we remove, you know, it's kind of based on, on a review of, you know, somebody asking us, hey, is this really, do we really have to, where we put the buffer, there's no channel here. So there's been a process in place to review those and we've removed, you know, several hundred segments of water courses from the buffer map. And so those are still public waters technically, um, but you won't see visibility of those on the buffer map. Um, good question. It's, um, you know, usually, um, you know, it, I don't know that we have set criteria for when we do that, so I'm, I'm kind of trying to think of what the process might be. Um, lots of times it's when there's a project where, where it really, it might, it might be a big project and it might really matter. It like a, just somebody you know pointing on the ground might not be good enough, right? You really need to know. Um, like I can think of one example in the last couple of years where um, you know how. Let's see if I can go back here. So if you take like this case right here, um, this might even have been the, uh, the, an example where. Um, it wasn't clear if this was part of the public water or not. Um, and um, the landowners, the people who own this, they wanted to put a road, they wanted to fill in here and put a road over that. And our, our rules wouldn't allow it, um, but we'll whack the wood. Um, and so in that case, um, it was, um, you know, we were thinking this is part of that, but in order to, I mean, it was gonna probably you know, you have these um, like uh, dominoes kind of on these, like somebody wanted to do a development here and they needed road access here for some, you know, for some reason, some county rule or something. And if we did a lot, if they couldn't have a road here, they weren't going to be able to develop this property, like put three houses on it or whatever it is that they wanted to do. I don't remember all the details. So in that case, um, you know, we requested a survey crew to go out and do an OHW. And so, um, so it's, it would be an, a, an example of where we wouldn't ask the, the survey crew is um, if, if it's just for the purpose of a land use program setback, you know, if somebody's just wondering like, okay, this guy, this guy here, or wherever it is, I think that might be part of the wetland. So they, they were, proposing some kind of development here. Um, you know, they want to develop here and they're wondering, there isn't an OHW determined for this. They're wondering, well, where, where do we show the structure? You know, where can they build the structure? We would say, you, you know, you county or city, you can go out, you can just tell them, you know, because they have to do a site plan, like topography. You can just tell them, you know, at that edge, you know, you can tell them, where you think that edge is and 50 feet back from there. So we wouldn't need an OHW in that case, a, a survey one. As far as our process to get a, a, once we decide, yeah, we want a survey, um, we would, we actually, we, like the area hydro actually are, has to fill out a requisition um, that's stating the, the reason for why it, it needs to be done and then their supervisor needs to approve it and then it goes into the queue for the survey crew and you know it's one crew and so they're kind of in high demand so I don't know exactly how they prioritize their work <laughs> um, I think sometimes what they're doing is they're trying to do it they're trying to like just group things <coughs> geographically like so say they're going to be on the road for a week um, doing some, they'll, they'll maybe try to pick up an extra survey or two along the way, um, you know, if they're going to be going right by it. They can be pretty labor intensive though too, so I mean it's not uncommon to have to wait um, six, nine months for, for them to do a survey. Um, 
And then sometimes we have, we actually have meetings where we talk about do we need, you know, we talk about when you decide. Um, we might have, there might be a conversation between like myself, the area hydrologist, their supervisor, the head of the survey, the supervisor of the survey crew, and we might all talk about, you know, do we need to do an OHW survey, survey here, you know, pros and cons. We generally don't like to do them if there's been one done before. I don't know if that was satisfied here. Great, if anybody else has any questions, let's just hold them for the end so that the court can Chad was really bummed that he couldn't come today. He was so excited about this, and then um, like a last minute conflict arose on Monday, and he he's really bummed. He even came by my, my office uh, today to um, bemoan his, his terrible luck. So, um, so today, Leslie and I are going to talk a little bit about our program, um, which I think generally when people think about the core, they think about the Clean Water Act only. Um, but I do want to remind you that there's actually two laws predominantly that we operate under. Um, the Rivers and Harbors Act, which uh, tributaries and waterways, we talk about that, as well as the Clean Water Act. Okay, so a lot of times you hear the core, we talk about jurisdiction. But when we use that term, for us, that actually means two different things. We have something called geographic jurisdiction, which is the actual physical feature on the landscape under which we would be uh, asserting one of our regulatory authorities or both. Um, and then we have activity-specific jur jurisdiction, which is then the law itself that gives us the authority to regulate that activity or the law itself that says we don't regulate a given activity. Um, so here we, I have outlined um, the two different acts that we predominantly use here in Minnesota. Um, so we have Section 10 of the Rivers and Harbors Act, and this is the, um, the federal navigable waters. There is actually a list of navigable waters, the federal navigable waters, and these are like the, the really big waters. <laughs> these are um, the Mississippi River, the St. Croix River, um, Lake Superior, those sorts of things. It is an actual defined list. We cannot add to that list, and we cannot subtract from that list. Um, the interesting thing about the Rivers and Harbors Act, it was written in 1899, it's, all of, it's predominantly all about navigation. So once it was listed, if a water is no longer a water, like it was now converted to an upland, they built some sort of giant pier out over it, it is still on the list. That is still a navigable water where that pier now exists. So we now have the term sort of navigable in law. Um, and what that basically means for you is work in that area that is part of the navigable water that is now fast to land still requires a permit. Um, so that's the, that's the physical, the geographic jurisdiction under the Rivers and Harbors Act. Now the regulatory jurisdiction is, um, we sort of said it's, it's all work or structures in, over, under, or affecting that navigable water. So the Mississippi River, you want to directionally bore under it, you need a permit. You want to put something over it, like so a good example was um, the Super Bowl, there's a zip line that someone put over it for um, people who wanted to zip line across the Mississippi River in the cold. Um, it sounds horrible to me, they need a permit, they apply for a permit. Um, because it was over the navigable water, and we have to, one of our missions as the Corps of Engineers is navigation, we have to protect that mission. Um, so we evaluated it solely under Section 10, there was absolutely no work that occurred in the Mississippi River, um, but that's our, our activity um, specific jurisdiction there. And then we have what we're all familiar with, the Clean Water Act, Section 404. 
Um, and so the geographic jurisdiction of that we refer to as waters of U.S. Um, they're A1 through A7 waters, which currently may not mean anything to you. We have a couple slides that we're going to talk about what those actually are. Um, and then we have, so those, so if we determine, yes, it's geographically that that wetland or waterway would be subject to our jurisdiction, we then have to evaluate, is the work you're doing in it subject to our jurisdiction? So, um, unlike the Rivers and Harbors Act, which is basically if you're touching it or even near it, you might need a permit, um, under the Clean Water Act, it's the discharge of dredged or fill, fill material. So, um, like an example of something that may not require a permit is if you're putting one post for a fence out in a wetland and you're just hammering that post in the ground, it's, that, may not, that probably doesn't constitute fill and we may not be regulating that. Even though you're in the water that's subject to our jurisdiction, your activity itself is not a regulated activity. Um, didn't work the way I thought it would. <laughs> um, so, this is where we're going to talk about, we're predominantly going to focus on the Clean Water Act um, because the Rivers and Harbors Act is just like everything. <laughs> so um, when we talk about the A1 through A7 waters, that's, that's Clean Water Act language. That's what we talk about as waters of the United States. When you hear that term, that's a Clean Water Act term. So we have our traditional navigable waters. Not to be confused with our federal navigable waters. <laughs> We made it real confusing for everyone. So, um, the federal navigable waters are generally TNWs. TNWs do not have to be um, federally navigable waters. So, these are predominantly um, they're waters that were used, or may be used, or susceptible to use um, for interstate or foreign commerce. Um, and then we have our, our interstate waters and wetlands. Um, so, the St. Croix River state boundary, um, Columbia River between Washington and Oregon. It's an it's, it's a interstate water that falls under Clean Water Act jurisdiction. Um, I'm going to come back to A3 in a minute. Um, so A4 waters are those <coughs> impoundments um, of waters that could otherwise be waters of the United States. So just because you built a dam across some creek doesn't mean then that um, the water above the dam wouldn't be subject to our jurisdiction. So an impoundment could still be subject to our jurisdiction. Um, tributaries to A1 through 4 waters, um, and, and I am going to expand on sort of what a tributary is in the next slide. Um, territorial seas, we don't deal with that here in our district, but um, those are our waters of the United States. Um, and then wetlands that are adjacent to um, any of these waters, A1 through 6. So let's talk about a little bit about A3 waters. Um, A3 waters are sort of like this catch-all for if it's not an A1 through 7, um, it's these other intrastate waters. Um, but they have to meet at least one of these three criteria. And so that first criteria is that um, it is or um, could be used for interstate or foreign um, recreational